All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to class two of our business 493, 493 experience. I'm speaking live and in color from Business Finance Central in Claremont, California. So I welcome you all. Hope you had a good week last week and um, you're all healthy and wise. Here's our agenda for this evening. We'll be discussing and reviewing just one of the key parts of the assignment number one, and those grades are posted. Some of us had some difficulties with the portfolio, and we'll be reviewing that because you're gonna have to do your portfolio again on assignment number two, which is next week, due next week. Then we're going to talk about uh, a little bit more about borrowing, and budgeting, chapter three, and take a quick look at chapter four, the topic for the next time we meet. You will have another assignment due next Wednesday, July 1st. We'll talk about that assignment a little bit later after our break. Also, you're gonna be doing something different next week in your off week. You're going to be talking with me. You're going to be uh, meeting with me individually next week via Zoom fitting into your schedule, and I will post that next week, and I'll send you an email to look at that. But next week, our off week, you're going to be meeting with me. It can be next Wednesday, if you'd like. It can be another day, where I'd like to, I, like to, I do this with all the online classes, is I like to meet with the students after the first couple weeks of class to make sure they're, uh, they're okay, they're comfortable, they understand what's going on and they uh, have any questions or concerns about the class. So we'll be doing that next week in our off week. <clears throat> so we're off and running. One of the uh, issues with uh, assignment number one and the main, the main issue, everybody did uh, pretty well, is, um, was the portfolio. And I know for a lot of us, this is the first time we've been doing this. So let's talk about the portfolio. If I can find it, just a sec. <laughs> it was here a minute ago. Ah. Just a Off to a little slow start here this evening. Bear with me. <laughs> you. All right, I think I got this straightened out. Boy, I never had this trouble before. It must be something I ate this morning for uh, this afternoon for lunch. Uh 
Okay. Sorry, guys. Professor Hasher usually has his acting gear. Now we got it going. Okay. <laughs> okay. As I was saying, one of the uh, issues with our assignment, and I have posted, here, here's how I do this. I've posted the, uh, you returned your files to the Grade Center with a grade, and I wrote some notes on them. And uh, I, anything that you had incorrect, I highlighted so you can review it. The solutions are in the uh, assignment number one or assignment file folder. The solutions to the assignment plus a copy of my portfolio. And this is the copy you see here. A couple of things where there were some errors on this and uh, we can clean those up because again, as I said earlier, assignment number two, uh, will, which is going to be your work this coming week, uh, you'll have to update your portfolio as of uh, a week from this Friday. So a couple of things. Number one, remember your portfolio has to total $100,000. So you allocate the investment into whatever stocks you picked, and then you take the stock price as of June 20th and you divide it in this column here into the 25,000 to determine your number of shares purchased. So the price and the shares don't drive your investment. It's the investment that drives your share amount. So as you can see, here's a formula equals this, this number divided by this number and I get the number of shares. Many of you, when you first do this, you get this kind of number. All right, then what I want you to do after you get that number is just use the arrow key to reduce and round to the nearest whole share amount. So again, then with that number being designated, you can total 100,000. Your price will drive the number of shares into that number. That's number one. And uh, another one, which was an error by many of us, is I wanted to see the Dow, S&P 500, and NASDAQ stock prices, index prices, as of June 12th. So that was an important facet to do, is I wanted to see those closing prices on that Friday, June 12th. And the reason why I want this, and I gave it to you in our sample, is because we're going to compare the performance of our portfolio over these future weeks, how the, our portfolio goes up and down, to how the market has gone up and down. And the market is these three indexes, the Dow Jones Industrial of top 30 stocks, in the New York Stock Exchange and the uh, NASDAQ Exchange. The S&P 500, the Standard & Poor's 500 Index, which indicates the top 500 companies according to Standard & Poor's in the country. And the NASDAQ Exchange, which is about 2,500 stocks, small and medium-sized startups, fairly brand new companies, 10 to 15 years old, NASDAQ. Now, Apple and Microsoft are traded on the NASDAQ Exchange, also, they're part of the Dow index. That's just the way it is. But these are indexes that monitor overall markets. The big index that monitors the market is the S&P 500 because it's made up of 500 stocks. So this is also was required in the portfolio. So make sure when you update your portfolio next time, you first of all put in the uh, June 12th prices, and you can get that from my spreadsheet that I've posted in the solutions for assignment one. And then next time, what you're going to do is in assignment two, you're going to be updating this portfolio. So what you should do is copy this portfolio. You can hit control C, or you can just hit copy and bring the portfolio down here by hitting control V or hitting paste. And what you're gonna do is update this to June 19th for your assignment number two, June 19th. Excuse me, did I say June 19th? I meant June 26th, but let me double check that here. Yes, June 26th, June 26th, Friday, June 26th. You're gonna update this. So you'll put in 626, oops. 626, and now you have a question. All right. Yes, my question is regarding, it's uh, Isaiah's over here. 
My question yeah. is regarding uh, – I just kind of just want to familiarize myself with with the brackets on the right where it says, where it says Dow and S&P because yes. I thought those were actually stocks on themselves. I didn't know. Nope. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I, I explained that a little bit last time, but that's okay. And I hope I, it's, it's an index of uh, certain stocks that track the market. Okay. Have you ever taken statistics? Taking it right now currently. Well, probably at some time in that statistics class, you'll be learning about indexing where you group companies or you group numbers together and average them out or index those numbers as a group. All right, that's a part, it's a statistical calculation. Well, these indexes are the market. This is called the market. Looking at it three different ways. The Dow Jones Industrial Index is monitored by, if you ever are familiar with the Wall Street Journal. Wall Street Journal is owned by the Dow Jones Company, which is owned by Fox, Fox News. Interesting. And Dow Jones Industrial Index is the top 30 companies according to Dow in America. And that is an index of all those 30 company stock prices over, over how long they've been in, in the index. The S&P 500 is a list of 500 stocks picked by Standard and Poor's Company. Standard and Poor's Company is a company that is the, it's kind of like the company that does the FICO scores for you and I. Standard & Poor's is a credit rating agency for corporations in America. And they've picked 500 stocks, 500 companies in America, and they've grouped them into one index by manufacturing, communications, retail, whatever. And these 500 companies represent the broad market of major American corporations. And the NASDAQ exchange or the NASDAQ index is a group of small to medium size or startup companies that have le are less than a few, you know, 15 years old. And they track those types of companies in their index. If you've, if any of, if you've been following the news lately, the NASDAQ exchange has been outpacing these two other exchanges rapidly as we're trying to recover from the pandemic. The Dow and the S&P are struggling, been going up and down. They went down big time today. But the NASDAQ, because in NASDAQ are Microsoft, are Apple, and most of the companies in the NASDAQ index are technology stocks. And the technology stocks have been still going, doing very well in the market. Whereas there's other types of companies in these index, and that's why they haven't been doing as well. But if I, if I, ever, if I have a stock portfolio, and we'll learn this next time in investments, if I have a stock portfolio, I'm going to judge the, pro the success of that portfolio by its performance versus these market indicators. Have I beat the market? Has the market beat me? We're going to practice that, especially in assignment number two, when you're now going to change the price as of June 26 for your portfolio, and you're gonna update it on that Friday with new prices. And then what you're going to do is you're going to now change this cell here and just put in 74, 450, 445 and so on. And then you're gonna do a new calculator calculation here, taking the new price on the 26 and multiplying it by the shares to get your new valuation. So how I would do that, I would just copy this by highlighting it and I would hit control C, which is copy, and then I would bring that down here, and then I would hit paste, and I would just paste the values, not the formula there, by hitting paste. Now, if you notice those cells, like up here, there's a formula. Now, it's the actual number. And then, let's say the price for Apple goes to $340 on June 26. I would then put a formula here, equals, this cell times, and the time cell is a star, times this cell. And now I would have my new value of my portfolio on June 26 because I've just made 88 bucks from Apple in two weeks. From the 12th, the price was 338.80 and I purchased 74 shares. 
Now on June 26, I purchased the price is 340. Multiply that times the original share buy, and I've made 88 bucks. That's what you're going to do in assignment two to update your portfolio. But and then once you update it, then you're going to update these numbers and see how these numbers have changed vis-a-vis -vis how your portfolio has changed. And that's what we do when we hire investment managers, retirement 401k managers. They track the performance of your funds to the overall market and let you know that we're doing our job or we're not doing our job. So this is what you're going to do in assignment two to update it. Here is what I was looking for in assignment number one. And most of you did this, except some of us didn't have it totaling 100,000. And some of us, a lot of us did not have the indexes of June 12th. So did I answer that question? Yes. Okay, very good. All right. So that was the primary um, area in the assignment one that I posted today where some of us were off. Just clean up that, clean up your portfolio, and then you're gonna have another, the same question in assignment two next week where you're going to determine your new portfolio valuation as of June 26. There's a sample of this Excel spreadsheet in the solutions folder for assignment number one, if you'd like to download it and use that as your template. Okay, that was the only real problem in assignment number one. We all did pretty well on that. Matter of fact, we did very well. And the grades are now that. So if you go into Blackboard, and if we bring up Blackboard, I'll show you. Here's our Blackboard site. And now if you go on the front page, you'll see in your report card a grade. That's your grade after or your cumulative average in the class as of assignment number one. So you'll see a grade there. So that's so far your grade in this course. And if you have any questions on that, any concerns, need a review of that work, just let me know and I'll be more than happy to review it with you. Also remember we have office hours every Monday afternoon from three to 5 p.m. where you could review your work or go any questions you have. If you're working then during that time and you can't get away, you can email me, text me. In our discussion forums right here, student discussions, you can post a question there that you might wanna ask me and I can respond to you through the discussion forum. You just click on this, create a thread, and ask me a question. So there's a lot of different ways you can ask and get information if you're having problems. If you're having problems doing the spreadsheet in assignment two, I'm not gonna give you too many of the state secrets to figure it out, but I will point you in the right direction to help you uh, with that work, okay? So assignment number two is next week and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But that was the problem, the main problem uh, with our assignment number one work is just making sure the portfolio is clean and giving us a proper indication. Remember the portfolio is you select the stocks, you make the buy based on the stock price of June 12th. And now we're going to track that every couple of weeks through the remainder of our course to see how we're doing. And the topic of investing, we'll go over the portfolio in two weeks when we have our next class. We'll talk about that portfolio from assignment number two and see how you're doing and, and try to figure out why did my stock go up and why did my stock go down? Why did the market outperform me or why did I outperform the market? Simple questions in investing. I'm sure every year, some of you 
get a report from your 401k plan or from your retirement plan and it says a bunch of mumbo jumbo that tells you how your retirement fund is doing. Half the time, you don't even really understand what they're talking about. Now we're gonna help you understand what they're talking about when we, uh, as we learn this over the next couple of weeks. So again, our grade is located under the report card. <clears throat> you can just click on that number and it'll go immediately to your grade center where you'll see your file uploaded that I graded and then returned to you. You can download that file to your computer and now you have a record of your first assignment and the information uh, on how I graded that work. Okay, so that's an update on our grading and report card situation and how now we're beginning every class, every week we're gonna be having some work where those grades will be accumulating over the next few weeks. Okay, good. Now let's do this. In your Blackboard, in addition to uh, you know the grading and your information on the course, as you know now, or beginning to know now, every week we have an uh, introduction video, we go over the facets of what to expect coming up. And if you go to class two tonight, our file folder for our class entitled budgeting, you see a lot of information. We're gonna be looking at these files in the next few minutes, but one of the files I first want you to look at is here. It gives you financial planning. Our subject tonight is banking, and is, is, is budgeting and borrowing. And the subject of tonight is making sure that you understand what financial planning is in budgeting. Why do I do financial planning? All right. A lot of you, a lot of you did a great job on the assignment number one where you gave percentages of what you anticipate your, your budgeted items in your life are. Now, some of you didn't tell me, uh, gave me a, like a brief example or a brief explanation of why you picked those percentages, and I took a couple of points off. But on the whole, you explained why you have those numbers. And a lot of you, the rent and mortgage were one of the higher percentages, and then so on. <clears throat> well, that's a good start to a budget cycle. Budgeting is called financial planning. It gives you the ability to understand where you're spending your money, it gives you an understanding that you're looking into the future perhaps on making some financial decisions. Is my budget allowing me to buy a car, uh, buy a house, rent a, rent a new apartment, get some clothing, maybe even pay for school. And it's called financial planning. And this slide in a week in our class number two gives us a highlight of financial planning and a breaking, breaking down by your age. You know, some of us at certain times during our life have different types of financial issues as many of you are aware of, all right? When you're out of high school, beginning college or beginning work, your first job, you're establishing financial independence. You're on your own. Maybe you're, maybe you're still working at home, uh, living at home, but you're beginning to earn an income, all right? You're thinking about growing your financial affairs. Then as you get older, you might become, you're still single, but you begin to uh, maybe start to having a, a get married or have a partner. Then you have to think about insurance. You have to think about retirement. At different stages during in your life, you, you may have certain obligations. And your financial planning changes at each one of these. So my question to a lot of you now is, and you don't have to answer this, is where are you in your, in your financial planning or where are you now in your life? Are you, are you in your first job? Are you haven't got a job yet? You're just going to school? Are you living at home? Are you living on your own? Are you married or do you have a, a partner? Do you have children or no children? And each one of those specific references gives you the, the beginning of financial planning. 
where do I want to get to? I want to, I want to get married in a couple of years and have a family. I don't want to get married in a couple of years. I want to develop my career. I want to make some money. Or maybe I want to do both. It requires planning, organization, discipline. And one of the common faults about people when they get into their 30s and 40s and 50s is a lot of them say, you know, why didn't I think about this when I was 20? <laughs> why didn't I think about this when I was 25? Why didn't I have any financial planning? Well, a lot, and a good answer to that is, well, I just didn't have the time to do or the money to think about financial planning. I didn't have any money. Well, whatever, whatever period you are in your life, you should have some sort of financial planning. We talked about financial planning the last time we met, having a bank account, having a credit card, having a credit score, understanding where my money is. Do I have any money in those accounts? Establishing credit, that's financial planning. You're not writing anything down, but by your actions with a credit card or by your actions and paying bills, writing checks, managing a checking account, managing a credit union account, managing a savings account, putting money into a 401k, you're doing financial planning. But where does that go to? Asalis, do you have a question? Nope. Okay, no question. So this is because nobody has their video on. I am like talking into a dark cave. Is anybody else out there? <laughs> I assume you're out there. Okay. So that's a key to budgeting. That's a key to borrowing. That's a key to investing is before you can do any of those things, you have to plan. You have to understand where you are, where you are today and where you want to get to. Mr. Hassey, I have no idea where I'm what I'm going to get to because the main reason is I'm just I'm not making much money. I don't have much of a career right now. How can I plan? Well, by taking this class, you're planning. Congratulations. By taking this class, you're planning. You're getting a business degree. You're learning about personal money management. You're learning about the basics. One one of the areas that I have a very big problem with our school systems is a lot of our high schools and junior highs do not teach about money management in school. And all of a sudden you're a senior or you're out in the workforce and you wanna to go to college and they're talking to you about discount rates and borrowing student loans. You have no idea what they're talking about. Now, sometimes the, ed the educational people are straight up and honest with you, but sometimes they're not. Not saying that about Laverne at all, but sometimes they're not. You should be prepared for understanding student loans, understanding what it's going to cost you to go to college, understanding how that will defer or affect your work or job now. That's called planning. Many of us don't plan. All of us should plan in some small way or large way, we should always have an idea of where we are today and where do we wanna to get to in the future. This is an explanation of it here. And then there's some, some file folders here that if you look at after class, I'm gonna bring up some of these now. There's a spending diary, money management worksheets, and personal financial data. Let's take a look at those. These are part of financial planning. There we go. One of the things about financial planning is to keep track of your personal financial data. You know, you'd be amazed, and I run into this all the time with people who are 45, 50, and 60 years old. Uh, do you uh, know where your social security, what your social security number is? 
Or do you uh, know where your social security card is? Do you know your driver's license? Do you know your checking account number? Do you know what kind of credit cards you have? Do you know the social security numbers of people that are in your family? Well, this is important stuff. And I, a lot of people don't keep track of this. And here's a spreadsheet called personal financial data. And this is on a spreadsheet. You can copy this and use it if you'd like. If not, don't worry about it. But it's just telling you about one of the first steps to financial planning and budgeting is to make sure you understand what you got. You know? Do you have a birth certificate? Where is it? Do you have a marriage certificate? Where is it? Social security card, where is it? Driver's license, well, it's probably in your wallet. But all these things you need to keep track of because they're the basis of your financial planning because it tells you what's going on in your life and what you have. I mean, to open up a bank account or to open up an investment account these days, you gotta know your social security number. You gotta have a driver's license or some type of ID. So you need to keep track of these. And you know, for a lot of us, we don't, uh, Mr. Hassan, I don't have the time to do this. What are you, crazy? I'm, I do, I, there's not enough hours in the day. Well, maybe on a Sunday afternoon <laughs> or a Saturday or when you have a day off, allocate it some time to begin to keep track of this data. It doesn't have to be that sophisticated. You can throw notes into a shoebox and keep track of it. Or you can buy a little lockbox and keep it in your house. Or you can get a, a safe deposit box at a bank. Now that's costing a little money, usually around three, four, five dollars a month, but you can get that and keep your financial records there. Have some location of where you are. And then also you can also set, begin to determine financial goals. You know, what do you want to do with your money? Where do you want to get to? What are, what are some of your financial goals? A lot of us have a, a lot of, we have a lot of goals in our life, but none of them aren't too financial. Geez, I hope the Dodgers win the World Series this year. Geez, I hope I, uh, I can have a good birthday with my father and parents next, next month. Or I'd like to be able to fix my car. Okay, fine. But also examples of financial planning are paying off credit or paying off debt, putting aside some money in investments or savings, Maybe in three or five, four, six years, you want to buy a house, buy a car. You have some type of goals. It doesn't mean you're going to, it's going to happen, but it gives you an idea of what you're thinking about, what type of goals you have in your finances. So personal financial data is a starting point to planning, to budgeting. Before you can budget or plan, you got to know, all right, what do I got? What are my basic financial documents? And once you have that out of the way, then you can go into, all right, what am I spending now? What's going on with that? A spending diary. Before I budget, I got to know what I spend my money on. Maybe do this for like three months or six months. Keep track of where you spend your money. Now, a lot of us now have, you know, we can do this on a spreadsheet like here, or we can do it in Quicken or QuickBooks, or we can just write it down on a piece of paper. For years, I never had spreadsheets. There weren't any spreadsheets. For years, I kept a notebook of my expenditures. It wasn't that specific. Oh, today I spent 75 cents on a newspaper. But just a gradual uh, accumulation of keeping track of what I spent my money on. A spending diary. And this is an example of that in this spreadsheet. Everybody see the spending diary? This is Brenda, you see it? Spending diary? I guess so, okay. So here's our a spending diary where you can keep track of 
what would you spend on transportation, housing, utilities, food, personal care, educate, whatever. You can name the columns yourself. But beginning a budget process begins with one, knowing what you have, your financial documents, as we just said, two, keeping track of your spending for a couple of months. Where do I, where do I spend my money on? First of all, it'll go, I spend that kind of money. Of course, this summer, now we're not spending much money. Not too many places to go to. But when it picks up again and when we start getting out as, as the pandemic develops, it, I think that's still going to be a while, but we should keep track. You know, naturally you're paying rent or you're paying for food, you're paying for clothing, you're paying for education, you're paying for, you know, whatever. You should keep track of that. That's the beginning of the planning process to, for developing a budget, a spending diary. Where does your money go now? And is that, what does that make sense? When you put those percentages in assignment number one, did those numbers make sense? And I'm sure for most of you it did because you've been keeping track of it. But then when you relay that budget to what you actually spend, do they, are they matching? This is gonna sound really geeky, but I've been keeping track of my spending in a computer for over 17 years. I can go to 17 years ago and see what I spent on certain things. And before that, I kept track of it in a notebook. Now that's geeky, but you know what? I bet you over time, I've saved a lot of money because I've said, you know, what am I spending that kind of money on? I gotta stop that. Or what, why am I doing this? I should allocate that money to something else. And especially when you have kids, and keeping track of expenses can be very tight because kids are another mouth to feed, clothing, education, whatever. So keeping track of a spending diary, no matter how crude or how simple you want it to be, it gives you an idea what you spend your money on. That's the first step towards budgeting. The first step to understanding your personal money management is where is my money going now? Where's it going? Here's a money management worksheet, okay? Remember we talked about where our documents are. This is a place where you can say, oh, you know, the other day, I, I, this is a true story. About two weeks ago, I, uh, I wanted to do some investment things, so I needed my social security card. Uh, and I usually keep a copy of it in my house and the original social security card is in my safe deposit box. So I went to my wife and I go, well, where's, my, where's my copy of my social security card? Couldn't find it, couldn't find it. So I went to my safe deposit box at the bank, which is only about three blocks from my house, took out my social security card, make a copy of it at the bank. I had to give them like 30 cents and I kept it back in there. So now I have a copy again of my social security card because sometimes investment advisors need to see that. It's a form of ID. Where you keep these documents? At home, in a safe deposit box, digitally? And how long have you had them? Or do you need to keep them all the time? Military records, birth certificates, divorce certificates. And here's, not to bring up a bummer, but here's a financial document that you need, hopefully not now and not in the near future, is a death certificate. When a family member dies, down the road when you're dealing with insurance or dealing with real estate or the estate of that person, you need to show lawyers, bankers, investment advisors, investors, the death certificate or they won't do anything for you. Proof that somebody passed. I know it's not very uh, attractive, but that's a very important document in a lot of people's lives who's in the family members, a death certificate, marriage certificates, even education transcripts, resumes. You should always be updating your resume at least twice a year courses you've taken, things that you've done in your, in your life that make you a better, more attractive employee, tax records. I wouldn't think, I, nowadays you don't really need to keep canceled checks. The bank does that for you if you have a bank that uh, has all those checks digitally, but all different types of things, whatever fits into your lifestyle. Knowing what you have as far as financial records, knowing where they are, and keeping track of a spending diary. 
all very important in part as part of budgeting and financial management. Huge, huge. And here's another one that this all is related to. Your FICO score, credit. Let's bring this up. Your FICO score. If you keep track of, of your payments, your financial records, you're making yourself more stable, more disciplined in regards to your credit and the use of credit in your life. You're managing your credit if you know where you're spending your money on, what type of credit you're using. And the FICO score is, and your credit rating is huge as you go through life. It establishes credibility with an employer. Many times they check FICO scores. When I uh, came on at the University of Laverne as a professor, they checked my, you know, it wouldn't be a very good idea if a finance professor is, uh, has bad credit. <laughs> doesn't know how to manage his own money. So they do a credit check of you. Many employers, if you wanna get an apartment or a loan, they'll do a credit check of you. So establishing credit is managing and planning. And this is what's the breakdown of your FICO score. Payment history is the biggest, how you've paid your bills. Third is how many, what's your outstanding liabilities? And how long have they been there? Have you got any new credit lately? And what's the, what's the types of credit that you use? Car loans, credit cards, student loans. These all make up a percentage of when they, how you establish credit. And knowing your financial planning, knowing your financial records, this helps you manage your credit and helps you clean up credit if you're having a problem. Very important. Another area for this, is, let me get that. Is right here. The other day I went to my, oh, about a month ago, I went to my FICO site and I pulled this down. I wanted to exactly know what makes up my FICO score. And it's kind of like the one I just showed you, but it's a little bit more updated. But where you, how you establish credit is based on your pattern and your financial planning, your use of your money, your understanding of your money. And remember, if you get a credit card and don't use it, that sometimes affects your credit negatively. So don't get a credit card if you're not gonna use it. Manage your credit card. Having any more than three or four credit cards is not wise. It's looking for trouble. Because then you have four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten credit cards, and some of them all, if all of them have balances, that's that's misusing credit in some respects, unless you have the significant income to pay those off on a regular basis. But if you're bouncing back and forth to credit card balances, that's not doing your credit any any good. You have three three maybe two maybe credit cards with with that you manage and pay off, and then they'll increase your amount of credit on that card, and you can. You have one credit card for vac travel, vacations. You have another credit card for household matters. Whatever. That's sound management. And I'm sure a lot of you do it that way. But FICO scores, credit scores aid in the development of your financial planning because it gives you the ability to borrow money cheaply. That's a key. Geez, I would love to buy a new car, but the monthly payments are too high. Why are they too high? Because of your credit. Geez, I, you know, I would love to, I'd love to add on to my house or I'd like to do this. I'd like to get a TV or whatever. I don't have, my credit is too expensive. So my understanding this and managing this does a great deal in a way how you go about borrowing money and managing it. This is part of financial planning. A huge part is managing credit. And I don't know about you, but in the course of my life, I've had difficulty sometimes managing credit got lazy, sloppy, didn't pay attention to balances. It happens to everybody. But overall, over the course of your financial life, if you maintain consistency and keep that clean, in the long run, that's gonna save you a lot of dollars and make the cost of certain things that you want in your life a little cheaper because it's cheaper to borrow. 
That's a very important concept. So credit management is just like financial management, just like financial planning. You do this with some discipline, it'll save you money and it helps you establishing a budget. I remember when I first started doing budgets on my own, I did my budget and I found that rent and credit card balances were the biggest part of my budget, almost 80%. Rent <laughs> and credit card balances paying them off every month. Why, why did I keep doing credit card balances? Because my rent was so high, when I wanted food or clothing or do something, I had to put it on a credit card. I, didn't have, I had a little cash flow, positive cash flow. So finally, I figured that out after a couple of years and gradually was disciplined enough and became a very boring person for many months, where all after I paid the rent and paid my fixed expenses, I paid off my credit cards and never did that again for the rest of my life. Always paid off the credit card balances. And if I wanted something, I paid cash. Yes, credit cards were great if I wanted to travel. Credit cards were great if I wanted to get a major acquisition like a television or something. But for day-to-day -day things like food and that sort of thing, no. Manage your financial planning to be able to do that. And I know some of you are rolling your eyes and saying, yeah, Mr. Hassey, easier said than done. And you're exactly right. But eventually you've got to get to the point of doing that if you want to buy a house one day. If you want to have a good retirement plan set up, you have to be that disciplined down the road. Doesn't mean you got to do it right now, but needs you got to get to that point in the future. That's an important concept. So all these, all these uh, files in your Blackboard and that we just gone over, FICO, breakdown of FICO scores, spending diary, management worksheets, personal financial data. These are all put into this course to give you examples of how you can begin to do personal money management and manage your own affairs and plan for your own affairs. Listen, I have good friends of mine who are in their 50s and they can't, they don't have a budget. They have no idea where their money comes and goes. It's a friggin' disaster. And they make a lot of money, but their credit ratings or their FICO scores are lousy. They have no concept of where their money goes and how, what's their spending. And they're 50 years old and they're managing businesses. And it's, it adds a lot of stress to their lives. It adds a lot of stress to their families. If you begin to get disciplined about this right away and build over time disciplined and a good sound approach, uh, this will save you stress and a lot of money over the course of your lifetime. But it requires you to sometimes make some tough decisions about spending, about money. It's really easy to say, geez, I would love to go out to dinner tonight, but I don't have the cash and my credit card is near max, but if I have enough to go out, uh, well, maybe you, go, you stay home and have a pizza. <laughs> I know that's difficult, but boy, in the long run, it's not, it's not too sexy and it's kind of boring, but just doing it a couple times, you'll be better for it in your financial planning. So let's take a little break. We've been here about an hour. And when we come back from break, we're going to be talking more about budgeting. We're going to be talking and taking a look at um, how this, how this, what a budget can do for you. And I'm not saying spend 60 hours a week on a stupid family budget. Just 30 minutes a week will help you manage your affairs. In, your, in our introduction video this week, we took a look at budgeting basics, which is, was kind of goofy, but kind of gives you some ideas about budgeting and planning. And so uh, this is what we're going to talk about when we come back from break and then take a look at assignment number two that you have to do for next week. So I'll see you all back at, uh, let's make it a little bit after 7.05. Let's take about 10 minutes and we'll see you back in about 10 minutes. See you then. Thanks.
Okay, we're back. Um, budgeting. Our textbook in chapter three talks about buddy, budgeting as a discipline. Understanding what your spending is, applying your spending habits to a plan of, of maintaining a budget, all right? Naturally, the pros, pros of a budget is it helps you in planning. It helps you in balancing your cash flow. Balancing your cash flow. What does that mean? It means you take home $2,000 a month after taxes. You only spend $2,000 a month of expenses. Balancing your cash flow. Because if I take home $2,000 a month after taxes and I spend $2,500 a month on expenses, that must mean I've been, I'm using a credit card. I'm establishing credit. I'm using, if I do that on a month to month basis, eventually I'm gonna, that's gonna affect my credit FICO score. So one of the pros of budgeting is to balance your cash flow. You know how much you take home, that's what you spend. And if you can spend less, then you can save. You can invest, you can put money aside. Now, a lot of us, especially in the early part of our careers, we spend every, every dollar, every nickel of our take home. But if, as you gradually develop spending habits, spending understanding, you might be able to start saving a little bit every month, putting some money aside. Because why is it important to put some money aside? what we're living through now since March 8th, the pandemic, when cash flow could be hurt by being laid off, furloughed. Our spending habits have changed in the last three months because of the pandemic. We still have fixed expenses, but maybe less cash flow coming in. Setting money aside can be a good buffer or a safeguard to that but you can't put money or save money aside unless you don't under, uh, unless you're balancing your budget, balancing your cash flow. That's a very important. As I said earlier, another pro of budgeting is es establishing good credit. That's the pros of budgeting. Establishing good credit by managing your money. And also the final big pro of, of budgeting is understanding, oops, understanding your habits and disciplines. You know, one of the reasons we get into financial trouble is sometimes we do, don't really understand what we're doing. We don't understand our habits, our, 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 our positiveness of managing money and our negativeness. For me, I know exactly what my, one of my key negativeness of managing money is, is I like to, to use technology. I'm always buying the latest computer, always getting an upgrade in my internet, always doing this, getting better things, always maintaining better TVs, using you know, all this stuff, always keeping up with technology. And a lot of times I just have to say no, because I don't, why get another TV when I don't really need one? Why should I upgrade a computer when this computer is left me doing fine? Understanding your habits and discipline is another pro to budgeting. What are the cons? Mm -hmm. The negatives of budgeting? Too disciplined. And this goes back to your personality. Sometimes you react negatively if somebody, if you're always got something to be accountable for. Geez, I gotta spend only spend $50 this week on food. Geez, but I wanna get a nice steak. Well, there goes the 50 bucks. And then you start getting mad. This damn budget's driving me nuts. Then you start making mistakes. You start taking short shortcuts. So you have to understand your personality. Can you be constrained? Can you have limits? Some of us can't do that very well. So sometimes a con of budgeting is it, it ends up falling apart because I don't like being that disciplined. I have to find a balance. I know I'm starting to sound like Sigmund Freud here, but that's true. 
another negativeness of budgeting <clears throat> is it's time consuming. To do it well, you have to spend a couple hours a week maybe or a couple hours a month to maintain it. And a lot of us are not, don't want to do that. We got other things to worry about. We got family, we got children, we got our career, we got jobs, we got Professor Hassey's class. Time consuming. That can be a, you know, God, I got to work on this budget. It's Sunday. I usually on Sundays keep track of this. I got to do that again this week, really? It's, it, it can be a pain. It can be time consuming. And you need to be aware of that or fit it into your schedule. That's important. And the final con of budgeting is sharing. What do I mean by that? <clears throat> Many times when we have a budget or we're man managing finances, we don't communicate that with our partner, with our family members. We th tend to put all that pressure on ourselves to maintain a budget, and we don't share some of the decision-making or some of the knowledge with our partner with the members of our family. One of the interesting things my father did to me growing up to teach me about finance and money management was when I turned about, when I became a teenager, I was around 12, 13. Every Sunday night, I remember way all the way back to when I was a young, real young youngster, is every Sunday evening, that's when my parents sat down at the kitchen table, it sounds like Ozzie and Harriet, but it's not, sat down at the kitchen table and paid their bills. Sometimes there were arguments, I remember. My sister and I used to go run and hide when they started talking about money. It wasn't that bad, but still. But when I became a teenager and started maybe having summer jobs or beginning to think about things, my father included me in these meetings on Sunday evenings of paying the bills. Even though I wasn't making much money, I could pay the bill, but he showed me and my mother showed me the process by which they managed the household finances. And boy, was that a good lesson. I learned about checking accounts. I learned about paying bills. I learned about credit cards. I learned about saying no, and I learned about planning. Boy, that was a great experience. And I to this day, I always thank my father for that. Yeah, he did screw up on a couple of things, but being participating in the family decision making or just watching the family decision making of finances <clears throat> was very good for me, helped me. I went to college and I knew all about my finances when I went to college. I wasn't, huh, what? Sharing is an important con. If you don't do that, it can cause problems. It can be a con. All right, so that's the importance of budgeting. And that's why it's important just in any small way you can do that, it's important because if you do not budget, what can happen? The bottom line, the not budgeting, and this is a, a subject you all should be aware of if you don't, if, it's called bankruptcy. 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 What's bankruptcy? Is when you have more debt than assets. You cannot meet your debt obligations. Credit cards, car loans, mortgage, mortgages, student loans, equity lines of credit, whatever and you have more than assets to cover those. You have to declare bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is a timeout, a timeout. Once you file bankruptcy in a bankruptcy court, the judge gives you a timeout to get your finances in a line. How are you gonna settle your creditors? Where you, where's the money gonna come from? Gives you a timeout to figure things out. And if you can't figure it out, you liquidate. You sell everything and start from scratch. If you can figure out the bankruptcy court puts you on a budget, your creditors are aware of this, they know when they're gonna get their money. That's an important thing. Bankruptcy is in forms of chapters. For corporations, it's chapters 11 and seven. For individuals, it's chapter 13. There's different types of bankruptcies different types of rules. They've mentioned that in our textbook. 
you have a question about that in the assignment this week. Why is it good to know about bankruptcy? Because you'll know that you never want to go there. Hell, the, our president of the United States has been bankrupt three times. He's president of the United States. He's still president of the United States, but he's been bankrupt three times. Bankruptcy is a way of second chances. So he's, a way, he's president. President, oh, sorry about that. I was just going to uh, comment on that. Yeah. So he's president. Uh, he's been bankrupt three times, but like the system is really flawed then regarding that. Well, he, he, th this bankruptcy goes back many, many years with our pre current president, and he's fixed it over time. I mean, he's done a good job coming out of it. Which, but it, basically, his bankruptcy was developed, was caused by he invested in real estate that, because of the economy, went south in their value. And then he didn't, then it, the mortgages became more expensive than the value of the property. So he had to declare bankruptcy to clean that up, and he did. Okay. Uh, yes, the bankruptcy system is a little bit is flawed. But, you know, uh, in uh, certain parts of the world, the bankruptcy system is you go to jail. <laughs> in certain parts of the world, bankruptcy system is public humiliation. But America, the bankruptcy system, yes, it has flaws, but it gives you a chance of, of restructuring, a second chance. I have a lot of friends who've been bankrupt, and they're still doing fine. Yes, they had to pay the price, and I'm sure the president paid the price when he had to declare bankruptcy and restructure, but he came out of it fine. We all do, if you do it correctly. But it's a form of taking a time out to restructure and reorganize and tell your creditors, yes, you're going to get paid, but at the same time, I need to figure this all out. And if you don't figure it out, then the, the bankruptcy court will say, well, it looks like we're going to have to liquidate. Now, our president never had to liquidate. He restructured it and figured it out. Nothing wrong with that. But bankruptcy can be like a dark cloud over your head. So you don't want to go there. But it's a way of restructuring and reestablishing your financial character, reputation. And it sure helped the president because he became president. Nothing wrong with that. So a bankruptcy is a form of, of, of personal finance. It's the bottom line. It's the end result. <laughs> And many times, if you don't budget or plan the use of your credit, or you don't understand your finances, your income, where you're spending money, and you don't do plan for that, it could get you into bankruptcy issues. And that's an important thing to understand. Bankruptcy just reestablishes yourself in the market. It takes a few years to clean that up, but it does. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you know, it's, it's a hassle. It's a pain in the neck. It's a dark cloud for a year or so, maybe three or four years, depending on how bad it was. But you can fix it. And that's one of the good things about our bankruptcy system. Yes, there's flaws. Lawyers, court costs are unbelievable. But it gives you an opportunity to restructure. And that's something that's important, especially when it comes to borrowing money. You should be aware of that. Under always read the fine print of a loan. Always read the fine print of a credit card. What happens if you miss a payment? What happens if you don't call them and let you know that you've had a change in your financial position? Understand all about that. Planning. Budgeting helps you in that planning to understand the nature of your, of your budget or your spending. It helps you understand, well, what happens if I miss a payment on my credit card? Now, that's not that big deal. You'll have to pay interest and maybe a late fee. But what happens if you miss a payment on a car? Sometimes with some banks, one car payment missed, they take your car away. You should be aware of that. It's an important thing to know. So budgeting is a form of, of planning. It's a form of establishing disciplines. It also can be constraining in its operation and its planning. But also, it helps you understand what can happen if you don't do this, if you don't plan or budget or understand your finances. It can lead to bankruptcy. It can lead to stress. It can lead to family troubles. And that's, you don't want that to happen. So that's, that's part of it. You share. You understand everybody in the family understands things. And it works out better. Sometimes, again, that's easier said than done because money scares people. <laughs> money scares people. 
And it won't scare you as much if you're familiar with where your money is coming and going. It won't scare you as much. It's still scary, but it won't scare you as much if you have a handle on it. And that's where this process can be very helpful. In assignment one, we talked, we looked at the beginning of, of our personal money management. We took a look at bank accounts. We took a look at examples of credit and borrowing in the market. We took a look at budgeting, just a, a quick glance of what, what we have in our own bud budgets personally. And we began to establish if we had extra money, if we had some extra money, how we would invest that money, where we would invest it. And now we're going to learn how to keep track of that. This is the beginning of establishing financial planning. That's important. So in In assignment number two, let me bring that up. We're continuing that discipline, that reporting of information, of understanding our personal funny uh, financial planning. Doing the next step, going to the next level, maybe a little bit more specific. All right. For example, here's our quiz, our assignment for next for due on Wednesday, July 1st at nine o'clock. So you got some time. Question one from chapter two of the text, but what we talked about tonight, in your opinion, I wanna know your opinion, what is better, chapter seven or chapter 13 bankruptcy? Explain that. Now, some of you might say, Mr. Hess, I have no idea what chapter seven and 13, so look it up. And then what does that say about how you would run your financial planning? knowing what those two definitions are. What is your opinion the better way to go if you do get to that point? Question two is doing a little calculations on a spreadsheet. I want everybody to do this. Now remember everybody, when I say a spreadsheet, I don't mean a spreadsheet copied into a PDF or a Word document. I mean a spreadsheet file because I wanna see the calculations in that spreadsheet file like the portfolio, and like this question number two here. If you follow these directions, you'll be able to determine what your monthly payment will be on a loan and how much that loan will be. All right, follow these directions and put them in a spreadsheet or you can put them in a calculator, but I prefer a spreadsheet. You follow those instructions right there, you'll be able to determine the present value of this loan. It's one of the, this is one of the steps or the calculations that bankers use, credit card companies use, financing agencies use all the time. I want you to run through that. So I give you a step-by-step step, step to, to figure it out. And you should be able to do that on a spreadsheet, not on a Word document or a PDF. What is the difference between a spending plan and a budget? I kind of answered that tonight. Do a little research here. This is about FICO. I want you to go to the internet. Remember, one of our uh, themes of this course is not only to learn about personal money management and the discipline of it, but also how to go to the internet to get information. Well, according to the New York Times, what is the typical FICO credit score for a home buyer today? There's an article in the New York Times recently about this. What is the typical FICO score if you wanted to buy a home today? And also, what is the minimum FICO score to qualify for a conventional mortgage? If I wanna go buy a house today, and my FICO score is 450, I know that the average for a FICO score is, mm -hmm, I'm probably not gonna be very qualified to buy a home. What is the minimum FICO score to qualify for a mortgage? Finally, wherever you live, this is kind of a good thing to do. Wherever you live, if it's San Dimas, Laverne, Ukaipa, the high desert, Glendale, Los Angeles, wherever you live today, find the median price for a home in your community. Look up, if you live in Upland, you can go to a real estate section or you can just go to Google and type in median price for Upland, California home. It'll give it to you. You can go to the real estate firm site. You can go to Chamber of Commerce. 
find me the retail, the retail price, the current price of a home in your community as of this week. That's an interesting, fun thing to do. I do that all the time just to track real estate prices in my, in my hometown of Claremont. So question number four is to find a typical average FICO score for a home buyer. What is the minimum score needed to qualify for a conventional mortgage today? And what is the average price or median price of a home in your community? It's kind of a fun thing to do, give you some good information. And question number five is, as I said earlier, update your portfolio as of the close of markets Friday, June 26th. Okay, that's this Friday. Update your portfolio. What are the changes in your portfolio in dollars and a percent? And how does it compare to the three market indicators here? All right, and remember, we looked at this earlier. And let me bring that up. Here's that portfolio I did earlier, where here's my original portfolio, and then if I updated it, okay? So let's, I'm gonna do a hypothetical. I've already put in my formulas here, all right? I'm gonna copy this down. And so let's say the price of, in Bristol Myers goes to $55 next Friday. The price, the price of Merrick goes to $80 next Friday. And Disney goes to $115, all right? So now I take this times this, and I get my new value. Equals this times this to get my new value. Equals this times this. So as of next Friday, this is hypothetical, remember, I got the new prices on Friday, multiplied it by my share balance. I'm up $674.06. Okay, that's cool, Mr. Hassey. I made, that's one answer, $674.06. That's how much I've made on my portfolio. I haven't gotten any real money on that, but that's how my portfolio has changed from June 12th to June 26th. Now, what is that in a percent? Well, to determine the percent change, I would take the difference between a 100,674.06 and 100,000, my original amount, take that difference and divide it by my original amount. So if I did that in a formula, it would equal, $674.06 divided by $100,000, my original amount. And I get a decimal, which I will convert up here to a percent and go to two decimal places. And my portfolio has changed by up, increased by 0.67%. Okay. And then you have your market indicators here. Well, let's say the market indicators, do I have the prices of the stocks today? I don't, I didn't bring them. But let's say my market indicators changed to 26,000. 3,000. And 9,800. All right. Well, how have they changed over the course of this period? I take the difference between here and here and divide it by this amount. The difference between here and here and divide it by that amount. The difference between here and here and divide it by that amount. That's how I determine the percentage change of those amounts. That's how I determine the percentage change of my portfolio. So you're gonna do that for your portfolio, your particular stocks, your particular calculations for next week in assignment number two question five. That's part of your work for next week. A little portfolio spreadsheet analysis. Follow my lead, no problem. Now I'm not gonna post this to Blackboard. You have in assignment number one file folder, this section here, 
But if you have a trouble with this, go over this video next week and try to walk through those calculations. Okay, right? that'll help you. But this is a good step to mo money management because you're actually performing the analysis of your portfolio. That's good. That's very good. So that's assignment number two next week. And here it is back here again. So you need to answer those five questions. And remember, two of these questions have to be in a spreadsheet, question number two and question number five. You can post multiple spreadsheets like many of you did in assignment one. And I need to see that. If you don't, if you give me this information pasted to a PDF, you'll get points taken away. If you give me the answer to this problem in a Word doc, you'll get points taken away. I wanna see the calculation in the spreadsheet, okay? Again, if you have any problems with that, let me know, but I wanna see if you all can figure that, figure that out and do it. That's good experience for you for down the road to do these calculations, to look, do this analysis, to begin to use technology to help you manage your personal finance, a portfolio. Pretty good. Okay, there's that. Now, next week, we're actually going to, in two weeks, excuse me, our next class is July 1st, all right? And then July 1st, this is gonna be our investment class. Class, excuse me, July 8th is our next class in two weeks from today. And in July, in our folder in investments, we're going to look at the definitions of investments. Stock, bonds, what is an investment? Mutual funds, 401ks, basic investments. Now, some of you know this quite well because I know some of you actively do investing or know about investing because I've had you before in other classes. Others of you have no idea what investing is. This is a starting point. That's a good thing. And we're gonna learn about investing. Remember, the goal of investing is to take money today and have it increase in value in the future. And you want it to increase in value more than the cost of money today, the inflation rate. The inflation rate today for, the, for a year, let's say is 3%. That means if I invested in the stock market today, I wanna make more than 3% in the next year. If I make more than 3%, I'm, stay, I'm making money and staying ahead of inflation, the cost of money. That's the goal in investing. And the goal in the long-term investing is to do that over a consistent basis over 20, 30, 40 years, and that'll grow into an investment pool that now you can retire when you're 65 or 60 or 55 and live off that and not have to worry about working for the man anymore. That's what a 401k is about. That's what investing in IRAs is about. To build that to a amount in the future where you can no longer need to have a paycheck from a job, your paycheck is social security and the money generated off your investments. That's where you wanna to get to. And I know when you're 25 or 30, you think, oh God, I'm never gonna do that. I said the exact same thing. And over time, if you're disciplined in your financial planning, disciplined in your budgeting, you can do that. It'll work. Trust me, it'll work. So we're gonna learn about these investments in two weeks on July 8th. And have an investment that you wanna to bring to class, a mutual fund investment, an ETF investment, exchange traded funds. If any of you invest in gold or commodities, bring those to class and let's talk about them. Show it to the class, show it to the, oh, I do this, this is why I do this. If you'd like to bring those to class, on the 8th, please do so. If you wanna screen those before class, let me know what you're thinking about doing and I will, I'll let you know what's the best way of going about that. But please, if any of you have a retirement fund, if you have a 401k, if you have any secrets to retirement investing, please bring those to class and let's talk about them, share them with your colleagues. It'd be very interesting. So that's our next class in two weeks, investing. But you're, gonna, you're, still, you're still planning on that and doing that every week with your portfolio in assignment two and learning about budgeting and planning to get to that point where you have money to invest. Right now, most of us, we have to invest because it's taken right out of our paycheck, social security. 
401k. It's taken out of our paycheck. We don't, we, most of us don't have a decision in that. It's just automatically done. But what when we get to the point where we are building up cash reserves or cash flow reserves, when we now can make other investments, what should those be? What is the risk involved with those investments? That's what we're gonna be talking about in a couple of weeks. Should I be investing in real estate or just keep it fairly secure and conservative in the stock market or in the money market fund? But should I be buying real estate? Well, a lot of that depends on your risk and ability to finance that real estate and also the state of the economy now. In the state of the economy, what's gonna happen in the future? That which drives a lot of our decisions to make investments. And so that's what we'll be talking about on July 8th. And please, if you have specific questions or concerns about investing that you have, you know, you don't have to get that specific, but we can talk about those in class. Mr. Hassey, I'm not pleased with my 401k performance. Can I change? That's a good question. Mr. Hassey, I'm thinking about doing different IRAs, different IRA investments. What, what would be best at this time in June of 2020? That's a good question. So if you have any of those concerns or questions, bring them to class and let's talk about them. That would be really good. Okay. This is a new record tonight, congratulations. I haven't seen one person all night. Not one, that's okay. <laughs> but it's a new record. Oh, there he is. Salas, thank you very much. You're a pal. Thank you, buddy. Good questions tonight, by the way. Okay, so that's our class for this evening. All right, you have assignment two due next Wednesday. And then also next week, probably around Tuesday, I'll be posting a schedule for meeting the professor. And we'll do that next Wednesday night, if you can fit it into your schedule. We'll do it on Thursday and also next weekend. Whatever you're fitting your schedule, if you can give me 10, 5, 10, 15 minutes, I'm going to be meeting with each one of you. And this is for a grade. It's part of your class participation grade. So if you blow me off and not see me, you get a zero. So that's, I don't want to force you to that, but this is a good thing to meet with me individually, talk about the class, talk about any issues, concerns. What are you getting out of this class thus far? This is a good thing. So we're gonna be doing that next week in our off week and I'll be sending you that information uh, after the weekend. So as usual, I'm gonna be keeping online and staying here if anybody has any specific questions, but uh, that's all I have for this evening. Again, I have recorded this class. Let me make sure I turned it on, I did. And uh, this class is recording and I will post this recorded lecture to our YouTube playlist and to the Blackboard link uh, tomorrow in case any of you'd like to see it again. So that's all I have for this evening. Good class, be well, good luck on assignment number two, and we'll see you again in person uh, next week sometime with our student professor meetings and then in class setting on Wednesday, July 8th. So goodbye and good night, everybody. Take care, please. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I just have one question. Yes, sir. So if we finish the assignment ahead of time, can we go ahead and run it by you? Well, you can run it by me, but I'm, I mean, have you, if you've already posted it, you mean? Oh, no, if we like send it to you. Oh, that's probably going to be a lot of work huh, for us and for you. Well, it's not a lot of work for me. Really, it isn't. But you, you can't send me the assignment uh, and I'll tell you whether you got it right or wrong and then you're going to go back and change it. I can't, we can't do that. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, so if you if you post it to Blackboard, it's if, if you're officially done, and you finish it early, and it's posted in the Blackboard, I then will can I can go back and answer you questions about whether you did it right or wrong and what was going on, but before that, I can't do that. Oh, okay, sounds good then. That was my okay, question. very Thank good. You. All right, go on, leave, get out. <laughs> Hi, this is Gabby. I'm Hi, more than Gabby. likely going to have a question every. Um, every week because that's the way it. So about the assignment, um, I was just confused on, I guess you had said something about the PDF. Um, if I were to turn in 
like my answers from, um, from the questions yes. um, at the PDF form. And then another one uh, with like a spreadsheet. I'm kind of confused on what you mean by that. I think that's why I I lost like points last yes. week. Is because, you yeah, did, Gabby. Because, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because I, yeah, I'm confused on what you mean by that. I mean, well, a spreadsheet I is like Excel. Do you know what Excel is? I do, yeah. Okay, so you, you do your work on a PDF or you put it on a PDF and you do all the written answers, mm -hmm. but I need a spreadsheet to see in the cells your calculations. With a PDF, I cannot see your calculations in the cells. Oh, okay. It, were you not able to see... Well, okay, by calculations, you mean like all the work that I did from it? Or? Well, one of the, the calculations I wanted to see in assignment number one is I wanted to see in the share column, you dividing the investment oh. by the stock price to equal the amount of shares. With a PDF, okay. I could not see that calculation. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I mean, well, honestly, I didn't put how I divided it. I didn't put all the work. I just, you know, did it on like a calculator and then- That's my uh, point. I don't want you to do it on a calculator. Uh, I want you to do it. <laughs> see, you're learning by using a spreadsheet, Gabby. That's the point. And okay. that's great that you did it that way, but I, uh, this is a part of the uh, learning experience is to have tech, understand the software and application so you can do this in a spreadsheet because a lot of employers have you work on spreadsheets. Right. So I, that's a good you know, thing to I'm do. Thinking, I was using the Google Docs um, spreadsheet form and I noticed it was different. And I was, I, I assumed that I was like, oh, okay, no, it's the same thing, but I'm completely new to obviously. A That's spreadsheet. okay. So I would have to download the Excel app. The app well, can't, do, don't you have, you just said you had access to Google Docs? Yes. You do you have access to the Google Docs spreadsheet? Yes, that's the one that I used though. And well, but, but you can you can do, do the work in that Google Doc spreadsheet and then save the file as an Excel file. Oh, okay. And there you go, okay. there you go. Okay. Or if, if, you, if you don't wanna do go through that hassle, just send me the Google Docs link and I will save it as an Excel file. Oh, okay. <laughs> but right. I'd rather you do it, but I can do that as well. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna try that and then if I really cannot, I'm gonna go ahead and let you know. And then yeah, that'd be fine. Like, yeah, okay. why not? that's great, Gabby. So if you, you go through that process and Mr. Hansi, I'm getting confused and this is not working. Just call me up or send me an email, Mr. Hansi, you got a few minutes, we can let's look at this via Zoom and figure this out. We can do that. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. All right, Gabby, thanks. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Can you also open up like a like a discussion for that assignment, that specific assignment in case anybody wants to communicate? Well, I've already done that. If oh. you go, and I, let me show you this right now. I'll do that yeah. for you. I've already done that. If we go to your Blackboard, and here's our Blackboard, and you go to here right here, it says student questions and discussions. Click on that, and here's a file folder. Any questions? about tonight's topics, chapters one through three, assignments number one or two, please post your questions to this forum. So you perfect. just post them there and I can answer your questions. Sounds good, perfect. Make sense? Yes. Perfect, good, so that's how you do it. Or you can send me an email or however you wanna do it, or you can just say, hey, Mr. Hassey, you got time today to spend like five or 10 minutes on a Zoom conversation? Sure, I'll send you the link and we can talk that way too. All right, sounds good. I'll see you okay. later then. Thank you for All right, thanks. Take Appreciate care. It. Hi, Professor. Um, Hi, who's this? Cheryl. It's Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just had a quick question. So the only thing I didn't understand, and I know you probably said it last class, but I didn't catch it. So the shares, like the number of shares, are we just making those numbers up? No, 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 no. Let me let me bring up the spreadsheet, okay? I'll show it to you. Hang on. Don't worry about this stuff down here. Look, this is what your spreadsheet should look like for assignment number one, okay? okay? And then here, notice this. This is what I wanted to see. This is the crux of this. So you determine how much money you want to invest in your whatever company you want to invest in, Cheryl, right here. And then you found the stock price on June 12th right here, okay? So, so the way I keep track of this in a portfolio, you got to determine how many shares am I buying, right? 
So how do you determine how many shares you're buying? You take the price of the stock and divide it into how much you want to invest. And I'm doing that right here in this formula. Equals G6 divided by E6. Okay. It's, it's taking this number and dividing it by this number. And now I get the number of shares that I'm buying. And this is going to be the amount of shares you have throughout the course. Oh. Notice in this one here, I'm taking G7 and dividing it by E7. So that's what I wanted to see in assignment number one, how you to determine you, everything is 100,000. So you allocate it there, you look up the price and now doing that calculation here in the spreadsheet, you determine how many shares you're buying. Oh, okay, I understand now. Okay, okay. that's just so confusing. Okay, now Cheryl, you have a different problem this week in assignment two, you gotta keep these same shares the same. Okay. Because right, you don't want those to change. So now you're going to, this week, you're going to copy this down mm -hmm. and paste it as values to keep just a number there. No more calculation. No more sell. There. See right here, I have a sell with a calculation. Down here, it's just a number now. Because now you're going to find the price of the new price, stock price on Friday the 26th. And now in this cell, you're going to do another calculation taking this times the shares that you originally bought to get your new value of your investment. Okay. Make sense? Yeah, definitely. And then I just had one more quick question because I I was kind of I kind of kind of understood what you were saying earlier for the second part for the assignment that we're going to be doing this Friday. Mm -hmm. So, um I'm sorry, how did you get the percentage again? The, oh, okay. The, well, remember, uh, th this you probably did this way back when in school and probably forgot all about it. I do it all. Yeah. I forgot <laughs> about it too. So when you want to determine a percentage change, you take the, the, the amount, the dollar change between your new value and what you started out with, the mm -hmm. difference between this and this, which is $674.06, right? Yeah. You take that difference and you divide it into your original value. So here I took $674.06 and divided it by 100,000 and I got a percentage. Oh, so, my, okay. so my portfolio changed by $674 or it changed by 0.67%. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. That sounds, that sounds easier than. <laughs> yeah. And, that, and that's a very, that's a calculation that's used every day in business. How much did we change in a percent? Oh, yeah, we changed 0.67%. Okay, thank you. That's an important <laughs> calculation to know how to do. Definitely. Thank you so much, Professor. I really appreciate it. All right, Cheryl. Take care. You too. Bye. Okay, sir. Um, so I realized I definitely, I had the Excel spreadsheet done, and then I realized when I went back right now and I looked at your notes on my first assignment, I realized that, I read the directions a little bit wrong. Mm -hmm. I saw where you said, okay, um, your your example was in PDF form. So I actually transferred my stuff to PDF form just to turn yeah. it. Yeah. Well, but I also indicated last, our first class and also indicated in the video that I wanted that in a spreadsheet format. Right. So I did okay. it in the spreadsheet and then I put it in PDF because... <laughs> yeah. But it actually works out anyways, just because now that now that I have a better understanding, it's okay because now when we do, like you said, for the second assignment and we're changing yeah. everything, then I'm just going to go off of that and then I know how to submit it now. So it's Perfect. Fine. Perfect. Good. Okay. Um, I did have a question though, as far as because even though I did do it in the Excel spreadsheet, I realized that I didn't do it how you did it. So in order to... Um, May show the calculations on how you want to see it. We have to put it in the box above, right? And then we just put the calculation in there, like how you have right now. Exactly. E6 divided by E6. Yep, exactly okay, right. In other words, you're you're telling this cell, which ends up being 74, you're telling this cell to get this number, you're dividing this by that. And that's what exactly. it says. That's that formula. Now, this actual file is located in the assignments file folder for number one solutions. I gave you the Excel spreadsheet exactly like this. So if you want to go in and download it, you got a template right there. Oh yeah, that's even better. Okay. So then I'll go ahead and just change my stuff over from my Excel yeah. spreadsheet over to this one, because that would be a lot yeah. easier for me, especially yeah. since it's already sectioned out. 
That'll be good. But I, I wanted, the reason why I gave you the PDF format last class, because I didn't want to give you the answers. I wanted to see if you could figure that out. Right. And I did, I, I did it. And, and then you did it. And I, yeah. missed, I read too much into what you said. <laughs> That's okay. That's but okay. it's okay. I can, I understand it now too. So I'll go ahead and start working on that. And then um, if I have any questions, I'll go ahead and just email you. Excellent, Brenda. Wait All right. Well, thank you so time. much. We'll see you next week. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. And we're done.